there's a state of emergency in Louisiana, in Mississippi, and as well in the state of Alabama. And that's because of Hurricane Katrina. The winds are really picking up already. There's flooding uh, on Dolphin Island. This is only going to get worse, folks. If you have not evacuated, this is the time to get out. A hurricane is going to affect us. There's no doubt about it. The wave action has dramatically increased over the past couple of hours. What is approaching uh, could be devastating. A major hurricane, Category 4 Katrina, is making landfall on the Gulf Coast. Guys, we are in store for one nasty storm. The eye of Hurricane Katrina has officially made landfall. This is not the Mobile River, folks. This is Water Street. We've got a lot of people in Alabama that today have no place to live. This stretches all the way across the Gulf Coast. I'm, I'm in a daze. We're all in a daze. I do not know how how to come back from this. We ain't got nowhere to go, nowhere to go. I'm, I'm lost. That's all I had. That's all I had. Ten years ago, all eyes were on the Gulf as Hurricane Katrina powered toward the coastline. I'm WKRG Chief Meteorologist Alan Seals. The first alert storm team looks back after a decade of change from Katrina's destruction. I'm joined by John Nodar, Jonathan Owens, and Melissa Constanzer. Katrina made landfall as a Category 3 hurricane with sustained winds of 110 miles per hour. The storm surge rivaled a Category 5. Flooding ended in death for many in New Orleans. After the levees broke, water covered the vast majority of the city. Katrina is the costliest natural disaster in U.S. history. Damage estimates top $1 billion. Hurricane Katrina was a huge storm with a huge impact. In fact, from where I am on Dog River, the landfall was 90 miles away. But when it came in, it made the water level rise 11 feet in the storm surge. The home behind me took on three feet of water, and that's an elevated home. The day before landfall, the wind was the big concern with Katrina. But we quickly saw that water carries its own weight, and not just on the river. Among its many marks, Hurricane Katrina left a transportation nightmare. Bridges and ramps on Interstate 10 and U.S. Highway 90 were taken out by moving water. Not just damaged, destroyed. In these pictures I took of the Biloxi Bay Bridge after Katrina, you see dozens of bridge spans pushed into the water. What happened? I can show you thanks to Dr. Brett Webb in the Civil Engineering Department of the University of South Alabama. Dr. Webb set up a demonstration in a wave pool to show how easily low bridge spans can be compromised by surging water. This is very technical. It's basically like turning the faucet on at your house to brush your teeth, except we get a lot more water out. First, you fill the basin with 3,700 gallons of water. That's more than what 60 bathtubs would hold. And then you turn on the waves. It's water moving with force. Dr. Webb explains. Because it is so dense, there's so much momentum behind it, the forces are really, really large. Mm -hmm. And so as the waves started hitting this very flat, relatively tall side of the bridge, it basically just started pushing off the top of the pile caps or the bent beams. Now, as the water level rose, it actually gave a little bit of buoyancy to the deck. The decks of the Biloxi Bay Bridge weighed over 200 tons. So there's just enough buoyancy pushing up and the wave pushing to the side where it started to hop and skip across the top and just slide. The deck is done. And so that's all it takes, you know, just a little bit of wave action on top of a higher water level and it's generally just enough to knock the bridge deck off the top of the pile caps. The emotional impact and aftermath of Hurricane Katrina was clearest from the ground. But to see the breadth and the scope of this devastating hurricane, you needed to be in the air. I had the chance to fly over the coast in live Chopper 5 after the storm, including here at Dolphin Island. And boy, did things look different then. We hadn't been in the air long before we were over a battered Biola battery. This fishing town relies on boats. And those boats seem to be in all the wrong places. We saw boats on land, boats on other boats, boats in the trees. 
On Dauphin Island, the West End was nearly wiped clean and the main roads shattered. Even the geography here changed. The island shifted to the north and split in two. The Katrina Cut, as it's now called, would never heal. If the Alabama coast was awful, the Mississippi coast was horrifying. Biloxi was almost unrecognizable. Huge casinos had been built on barges to satisfy a legal technicality as riverboats. Some had floated across Highway 90, ramming other buildings and flattening everything in their path. Bridges were in shambles. But the most striking thing to me was the scope of the destruction that was so clear from the air. It was mile after mile after mile of empty foundations where familiar landmarks and stores and restaurants and homes used to be. Katrina's storm surge impacted much of the Gulf Coast. The Alabama State Docks recorded water levels nearly 12 feet high along the bay. Hurricane Katrina created an angry Mobile Bay. Water covered the causeway and at points the bay moved up the ramps to Interstate 10. Strong wind and waves made for a dangerous situation. The water crashed just a couple feet under the bayway. And on August 29th, WKRG reporters Tiffany Craig and Kimberly Kurt watched the water along the bay rise higher and higher. We are in downtown Mobile on Canal Street. The cross street right behind me is Jackson. I don't know how well you can see it, but the water picks up right where we are and goes all the way back as far as you can see down on Canal Street. If you can look behind here, now that we've got a break from this wind, I want you to see this. Water Street is under water. Let's see if we can try to get a wind gauge here. The Mobile River expanded and flooded downtown Mobile. WKRG's Randy Patrick was broadcasting live and couldn't believe what he saw. This is Water Street uh, that now, uh, well, actually could be called it Mobile River Street, because right. uh, Mobile River uh, banks, uh, it has uh, come up and risen to uh, maybe historic proportion. The storm surge from Hurricane Katrina almost covered stop signs and street signs. The rushing flood water damaged several buildings downtown, including the Convention Center, Explorium, and what is now the Renaissance Riverview Hotel. The power and fury of Hurricane Katrina is hard to forget. The Big Easy certainly wasn't taking it easy post-Katrina. Driving through downtown, there was definitely damage on the early morning of August 29th, but residents were heaving a sigh of relief as some thought the damage wasn't as catastrophic as predicted. That was before the levees broke. The first breach was reported at 9 o'clock Monday morning. These people can be seen fleeing the rising floodwaters on foot. Later, another incredible scene. A building on fire, water everywhere, but none to put out the fire. The inadequate levee system continued to fail after being beat up by storm surge and pump failures. The 20 breaks in the levee system led to catastrophic flooding that affected 80% of the city. A ship was set down in someone's backyard by that storm surge. See all the debris on the roofs, how high the water was? Our own photojournalist Randy Lowe, who is from New Orleans, shot these incredible scenes. The wind damage, while bad, could have been much worse if the storm hadn't weakened slightly before landfall. Long lines began forming at the Superdome as people waited for help. And some residents ended up in the infamous FEMA trailers. Katrina is a storm that will always be remembered for her water and not her wind in New Orleans. The name was retired after the 2005 season. Many of the men and women stationed in Mobile with the U.S. Coast Guard became heroes during Katrina. The U.S. Coast Guard Unified Command Mobile rescued oh, nearly 5,000 people in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Pilots, rescue swimmers, and flight mechanics risked their lives during and after the hurricane. In the aftermath, the Coast Guard played a vital role in cleanup. Crews removed nearly 600 vessels and thousands of hazardous waste containers. We never saw those guys again. Storm survivors turned refugees. Ten years later, transplant families struggled to talk about Katrina. Meet some of them up next.
Before Hurricane Katrina, many people from New Orleans evacuated to Alabama and ended up staying. They didn't have homes to go back to. News 5's Devin Walsh shares the story of one teacher at Sims Middle School with a real experience to talk about. When the storm hit, it was so bad. Um, it's been 10 years, but assistant principal Tony Gawalabin can't talk about Hurricane Katrina without getting teared up. We never saw those guys again. His students at Sims Middle School listen intently as he tells them the story of how his family evacuated. Our house was underwater, so everything that we had um, was lost. The Gawalabin family lived in the heart of St. Bernard Parish. Their kids were in first, second, and fourth grade when Katrina hit. I packed maybe a, one shirt and one pair of shorts. I packed all my stuffed animals. This was the perfect storm, the worst case scenario, and it, and it was a reality. It came true. The Gawalabeans didn't return home for a month, and when they did, they had to wear hazmat suits to go inside. We had an entertainment center that was here. Water had gotten so high it went over the roof of their home, and there was mud and mold everywhere. You had no idea what was um, in this water. When the Guala Beans returned to their house about a month after the storm, they were hoping that at least their pictures would be salvageable because they'd put them in a Tupperware container like this. But they were sad to find out that the water had gotten to most of them and they looked like this. Only a few faces were recognizable. They were able to bring two sentimental items. This angel sat on their entertainment center. During the storm, it came off the entertainment center, floated through the den, out, out of the front door, and up to the roof. And this statue that used to sit outside their New Orleans home is now here in Mobile. One of the things we did bring back was our uh, Blessed Mother statue. That's very important, very meaningful to us. The children settled in school in Mobile, and Tony and Sharon got jobs with the Mobile County Public School System. Very welcoming and, and just very generous. I mean, we even had one uh, person from our church uh, loaned us one of their cars. And that was a tremendous help. I feel like I'm at home, uh, very happy where I am, and uh, hope to spend many more years here. While the last 10 years have been trying, the Gwalabines feel fortunate to call Mobile home. Devin Walsh, News 5. Katrina hit South Mobile County extremely hard, especially Biola Battery. Bill Riles takes a look back at the devastation in Alabama's seafood capital. This is what people in the bayou saw once Katrina left. Some of them they got back in the water and some of them they didn't, but it was, it was really bad. Lands and his father, Gordy Taylor, are lifelong Bayou La Battery fishermen. Taylor, now almost 90, said it wasn't high wind or heavy rain that did the damage to his house. It was the storm surge. Katrina come along and they put 27 inches of water in the house and burned all my furniture and everything. At that time, his house was ground level. The bayou is his backyard. Taylor evacuated to Grand Bay during the storm, but when it was over, he had to start rebuilding. I rebuilt it before they raised it, and a femur come and raised it up, and, and now it's thir take 13 and a half foot of water to come in this house. And Taylor wasn't the only one, of course. Next door to his house, the Hemley Road Church of Christ had four and a half feet of water inside. All along the bayou, the storm flooded homes and scattered boats like they were toys. All the boats just kind of just washed out in the trees, really. And for a long time, the remnants of the storm were visible all over town. And people had everything out to the road, you know, from the house, and just, you go down the road, and you couldn't hardly drive down the road for junk on the road from flooded out people. You know? Land says it's hard to say when things began to feel normal again, or even if there is a normal following such a devastating storm. But even with the ferociousness of Katrina, for people here, it's just another part of life on the bayou. But here look at it today, here it is 10 years later, you almost can't tell nothing happened, but he did. I mean. In Bayou La Battery, Bill Riles, News 5. Could have had just split in half. Water came and had just, just opened up, divided. And I, I, I hold her hand tight as I could, and she told me, you can't hold me. People wandered the streets looking for their families after Katrina made landfall. One man's story will never be forgotten. Up next, Hardy Jackson.
and how WKRG shared his story around the world. A man named Hardy Jackson became the face of Hurricane Katrina. The story of how he lost his wife was the first indication that this storm was deadly. Roseanne Haven takes a look behind the scenes at how Jackson's story unfolded on the streets of Biloxi. He did not refer to any injuries or loss of life there, uh, but... The storm had passed. No reports of deaths. Mel Showers and I felt a sense of relief. You could see it in our faces and hear it in our voices. The officials simply can't get out into those areas to find out just how bad it is. But we would soon realize the true devastation of Hurricane Katrina. Let's uh, go to Jennifer Mayerly. It is a scene in Biloxi like no other. As reporter Jennifer Mayerly walked us through the devastation, you see a car pull up. A man and two children step out of it. When they walked up to Jennifer, everything shifted. I lost my way. How are you doing, sir? I'm a dead good. What happened? <laughs> the house just split in half. Your house well, split in half? Right here on Hollyham, Bay Vrew. You know, we came up in the roof, all the way to the roof, and the wall came and the house just, just opened up, divided. Who was at your house with you? My wife. And where is she now? Can't find her body. She gone. You can't find your wife? Oh, she told me, every, she told me, I tried, I, I, I hold her hand. Jennifer cries and wipes away tears as she tries to get information that may help to reunite him with his wife. Yes, my kids. What's your wife's name in case we can put this out there? Tony Jackson. And, okay, and what's your name? Hardy Jackson. Where are you guys going? We ain't got nowhere to go, nowhere I'm going. I'm, I'm lost. That's all I had. That's all I had. I don't know what I'm going to do. Katrina is proving to be a death. It, 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 it two or three more bodies ran there where I stayed at. Laying, laying right there in the mud. You guys, you take care of your boys, okay? Okay. Katrina is proving to be a deadly storm. For now, reporting in Biloxi, Jennifer Merrily, News 5. I think we need to go to a break. We'll return with more in just a moment. The heartbreak drove me to tears. I had to remove myself from the anchor desk. <laughs> that is terrible. Oh, my God, that's terrible. He had no idea what we were doing. He just saw the news crew, saw the news camera. Out in the field. Told his story. Photographer Arnell Hamilton. He, then he left and got back in the car. Recalls what happened when they wrapped up their interview with Hardy Jackson. Jennifer got really, really emotional, and she grabbed me. And as I was holding her, it felt like five minutes, but I know it was only like a minute or two. But as I was holding her in my arms and she was crying on my chest, that's when it really hit me. Man, you're being so selfish. Here you are trying to get back to your wife, and this man just lost his wife. Now, I didn't cry, but I really, really felt the emotions of that moment. A newlywed at the time, Arnell hadn't heard from his wife. He was eager to get back to her in Mobile. He and Jennifer had been reporting on this storm from Louisiana. Against the advice of state troopers, they traveled on Interstate 10. Anything that you can imagine from your house was on the interstate. I'm talking about from refrigerators to couches to beds, you name it. It was on the interstate. So we were driving, weaving through the debris on I-10. Arnell and Jennifer decided to stop in Biloxi to assess the damage there. It was like it was on a, like a movie. People were walking around like zombies. But I don't know where they were going. They were just walking around. Looking back, Arnell believes God sent Hardy Jackson to them to tell his story. Oh, but he's going to be fine. He's going to get a house and all that stuff. One that got him the support of musician Frankie Beverly, who bought him a house and moved Jackson and his family to the Atlanta area, where he and Jennifer stayed in touch. But Jackson's story would continue to be one filled with tragedy. In my opinion, he started dying when he let his wife hand go. 
he slowly started dying then. His daughter died of cancer, and he too became terminally ill. Till his dying day, he kept his promise to his wife, Tonette, to care for their children and grandchildren. And I'm going to be with them, you know, until the Lord said, your work is dead, you know, it's it time. You know, it's time for you to come home. Hardy Jackson died of lung cancer in 2013. His wife's body never found. But Arnell believes wherever they are, the two are back together. Whenever they separated, I think he wanted to get back with her. I think they are together. I truly believe that. Roseanne Haven, News 5. The storm surge in Biloxi reached 22 feet. But the highest water mark was actually 34 feet measured on the Beau Rivage Lighthouse. In 2005, just before Katrina, codes were increased so that new residential construction on Dauphin Island had to withstand a three-second wind gust of 150 miles an hour. County engineer Joe Roofer says there was a lot of backlash from the construction community. If you look at it like perhaps a practical person may look at it, is I've been building houses here in Mobile 20 years and they've never had one blow down. So why are we doing all this? After Katrina came through, though, there was less complaining. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it, it makes everybody wake up. And standards were made even stronger after Katrina. For example, a house built at Dauphin Island in 1993 had to handle a 99 mile an hour wind. That was up to 137 in 1995, 150 right before Katrina, and 160 afterwards. I lost his own. Roofer shows us the revised wind maps, but says the bigger impact from Katrina was a new awareness about flooding. The emergency management community for years and years have, have always had a say, saying, and that's hide from the wind, but you run from the water. Katrina produced the highest storm surge in Mobile County history. It was a 500-year event. It was an eye-opener for, for me, I can tell you that. I, I, never, I never in my wildest imaginations thought that the that a storm that would hit New Orleans would, would, would exceed our 100-year flood elevation here in Mobile County. New flood maps have been adopted, new flood plains established. A higher standards and needed step, says Roofer, but the real lesson learned from Katrina, awareness and preparation. You know, there's no question about can you have a Hurricane Katrina because we've done, been there, done that. You know, now there may be a slight probability, a low probability it'll happen again, but if it happened once, it could happen again. Peter Albrecht, News 5. Over the last 10 years, hurricane tracking technology has blossomed, but hurricanes will always be, to some degree, unpredictable. I'm Alan Seals. And I'm Jonathan Owens. I'm Melissa Constanzer. I'm John Nodar. Thanks for watching.